Okay, good morning everybody. I wasn't expecting you to be up first, but okay, I don't mind being the, uh, being the warm-up man. Someone's got to do the job. So those of you who have been here all week, you've heard quite a lot from our, our techno enthusiasts at Metafit and the Informatics Lab. And probably you've realised that at some point you used to be exposed to a, a real number of staff with sort of sort of more traditional Metafit view of things. Well, your moment has arrived. My name is Philip and I'm a climate scientist here at Metafit. Consequently, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking to you about the weather. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with today's weather or tomorrow's forecast or anything like that. I'm a historical climatologist and do old weather, right? So we're going to be talking mostly about the weather of 100 years ago. And actually, I aim by the end of this to explain to you why that's important and why that's interesting. Right? So this talk follows on very nicely from Ed's excellent talk yesterday. We'll be following on some of the same themes and indeed some of the same visual styles. And I'm about to show you also a few cool visualizations along the way, right, just to show you how the web and graphical tools feed into sort of what you might call ordinary scientific practice. But principally today is about telling stories. Right? So I thought I'd follow on the climate theme by trying to tell some stories and trying to explain how those stories feed into climate research and the work that we do here. So here's a story. Now, those of you who are into design may look at this and think, no, not much good that, a bit under-designed. This was indeed made by a bunch of scientists. But I still think the story it tells is relatively clear. And unless you've been living under a rock for the last decade or so, you'll have seen this before and you know all about it. Because this is a picture of global warming. There's a lot of evidence out there for global warming. This is the best. Right? This is the information that we make here at the Met Office. And essentially we're saying, how has the global temperature varied over the last 150 years? And to find that out, we need thermometer measurements. And we're essentially collecting lots of thermometer measurements, making an estimate of the average global temperature. Now, I look at this and I think this is quite clear, this is persuasive, but it's, you know, it's interesting, it gives you some reasonable idea of what's likely to happen in the future. But as a, as a persuasive tale, this figure's been relatively unsuccessful. A surprisingly large number of people still don't believe it. And consequently, I'd like to, to, to dig into the details of that. You know, the question actually I'm seldom asked is, how do you guys know this? Where does this information come from? Right. And of course that information actually comes from people. So let's go back and look at a human story that actually feeds into this particular information. So come back with me, if you will, a bit over 100 years, to the early years of the 20th century. And there's a story that's told about this period that, you know, in about 1912, 1913, an advertisement appeared in the newspaper, probably the Times of London, Right? And this was, in fact, the advertisement. Fair no distraction already in this talk. This was a subsequent expedition to the, to the one we've seen the, the, the day from before. Now, I'm sad to tell you that this story is probably apocryphal. It's a great advertisement. We've looked really hard to try and find the original, and always failed. It's almost certain this is a fake somebody made up in about 1950, but it's a good fake. <laughs> and this, the advertisement may be a fake, but the expedition was real. In 1914, Shackleton did set out for Antarctica with the ambition of crossing it from one side to the other. Here's a picture of one of his ships. This is the ship that he was on, HMS Endurance. And that ship sailed down into the Weddell Sea. The idea was to drop a party on the shores of Antarctica. They would walk all the way across the continent to the other side and be picked up by another ship. If you've read Shackleton's book, South, you know all about it. If you haven't read the book, you probably already know that this expedition is famous. It's famous as a story of heroism. And it's famous as a story of heroism because it was a total disaster from start to finish. <laughs> so in fact, the Jones was nicked in the sea ice, was crushed, and never even got to Antarctica. And you might look at this picture, if you, if you went back uh, 101 years to November 1915, and you stood in the Weddell Sea, you could see exactly this sign. And you might look at this picture and say, okay, this expedition is a bite off, it's a disaster. But as a climate scientist, I don't look at it like that. Because this, you know, this may be a story of heroism, but this isn't actually just a beautiful red. This is actually a picture of the Weddell Sea Meteorological Observing Station. Because we sent this ship to Antarctica with a full set of meteorological instruments, carefully produced and calibrated at the Met Office, instructions on how to use them. And, uh, and uh, they made regular observations, they recorded them in their records. Okay. Here's some actual information on the, on the weather of Antarctica. This piece of paper was, was on the ships. They never published their results, 
But they've learned to see our virus for 100 years, they've kept it for polar, right? We've actually relatively recently rescued them, and we're starting to use them in science to understand how the plant goes. So we heard back on Tuesday, I think it was, about the importance of your scientific work being preserved for the long period. I'm thoroughly signed on to that. This government lasted almost exactly 100 years between being produced and being, being uh, used in scientific analysis. The records aren't always the greatest. We did actually use this information. This is the position of the ship, if you're interested. Um, in an ideal world, we'd like people to write up and analyze and publish their results, but if graph notes are all there is, then graph notes are all we can work on. So Shackleton and his crew, this expedition, they weren't great scientists, although they did produce useful observations. They made up for it by being extra heroic. So famously, they did an 800 kilometer boat journey from the Southern Ocean, from Madison Island to South Georgia, in, in, in this boat, with James Kerr. Right? And they managed to save not only all the crew, but all their observational records, right? which is why we have them here today, and we can use them. We've taken those observational records, and we've actually used them in reconstructions. So yesterday, Ed showed you some, uh, some uh, reanalysis results, where you actually, we would actually reconstitute the state of the atmosphere from the observations, and he told you about the fog of ignorance, where it's away from all the observations. We've done such a reanalysis using these new observations, using the story produced by the, uh, the Trans-Antarctic Expedition, and we can actually say some new things about the climate, particularly of Antarctica and the sea ice state as a result. So that's one story, one set of observations. Now we're near enough understand the climate of 100 years ago. So in fact, this is a picture of our observation data set. And again, this comes from 1916. This is the information on which we base our knowledge of the climate of the past. Right? Every yellow dot on this picture is a weather observation. This is the International Surface Pressure data set. So there's about 1.9 billion observations in this data set, covering the whole period back to about 1800. Right? And that's a lot of observations, but obviously it's nowhere near enough. If you look at this and say, where do we know the weather? In North America, Northern Europe, the North Atlantic, things are looking pretty good. South America, Africa, the Southern Ocean, the Arctic, nothing. So part of my job is actually to look at this and say, come on, we need to do better than this. Right? We need to go back in time, go out and make more observations, find out what was going on in all those places where we don't have information. Let's tell the stories of people in Antarctica, in South America, in Africa, in the Arctic. Right. Now, obviously, I can't actually go back in time. But time machines are more common than you think. This is my favourite time machine. Next time you're in London, if you fancy a visit to Kew Gardens, turn the other way and you get a tube, and you'll end up at the, at the National Archives. If you go into this building and say, okay, what have we got? We need, we need information. We need human stories about the weather from 100 or so years ago. They will give you a pile of paper so that I'll you. There are a lot of documents in this building. In those documents, there's a lot of information, right? Exactly what we need. We want to understand how the climate varies over the long term. So let's tell another story about a particular document. This is actually one of my favorite sorts of documents, right? It may not look much. This is an official government document. In fact, this is a ship's logbook. The Royal Navy is an excellent source of climate records. Very systematic observers. There were, 100 years ago, a lot of ships. Government records, we kept all their records. Well, we haven't actually, but we kept a lot of their records. This is the logbook of a particular ship. This is HMS Invincible's logbook. She was a battle cruiser. And this is from 1914, 1915. Right? The periods around the two world wars are particularly badly observed, so we were particularly keen on records from this period. So this is exactly the sort of thing we produced. National Archives has hundreds of thousands of documents like this millions of pages of useful information. What does it look like? Well, it might not look too exciting to you, but actually there's quite a lot of useful information in this. A ship's logbook, this is a double page spread. Each page contains the information for one day. At the top we have the location of the date. And then every hour as you go down the page, starts at midnight, ends at midnight, right? they make a little record of what they're doing. And critically, that record often includes really useful scientific information. So in September 1914, when this page came out, HMS Invincible was in Scarborough Flow in the office. And at 4 o'clock in the morning on the 27th of September 1914, I can tell you about the weather, 
The wind was from the south southwest. Both of force one, a gentle breeze, if you know your boat scale. Right? I've got barometric pressure, 30.99 inches of mercury. Right? And I've got three temperatures: the barometer temperature, the air temperature, and the wet bulb temperature. And from that, we can get the atmospheric pressure, the temperature, and the humidity. A perfect record. And this ship, like all ships, recorded that once a watch, six or seven times a day, every day, every ship. And I told you it was about stories. And HMS Invincible, like every ship, has her own story. And I chose this logbook because actually it's got one of my favorite pages in the whole collection. So this comes from the same logbook. So we've moved on a little bit of time. This time we're in the 8th of December, 1914. And if we start to look in more detail, we can see that the ship is actually in the Portland Islands, down in Port Stanley. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, we have a weather observation. Excellent. We also learned that they're removing a cable because they've got tangled around their propeller. It sounds a little careless to me. <laughs> at 8 a.m., four hours later, next watch, I expect another weather observation. But we don't get one. Instead, there's a little marginal note, which you can read very carefully, just starting here. Strange vessels sighted on the horizon of the sun. And sometimes there isn't room in the log book for all the stuff you want to read. And if these vessels turned out to include the Scharnhorst, the flagship of Admiral Count von Schwein, which was in fact leading the German squadron, the Invincible had been sent to the South Atlantic to try and find. But this is a real-time, first-hand account of the Battle of Portland. This ship was on the winning side in that battle, otherwise we wouldn't have heard of it. And you can see it actually uh, head on, uh, and the, the, the details of the account given. Right? The battle actually ended at, at uh, 6.20 p.m. with the sinking of the nice now. But it was six hours after that, by the time their heart rates had calmed down to the point where they realized what they were really out there for on their most important mission. <laughs> you don't get that next closure observation until we <laughs> So this is a story. This is an example <coughs> of a, a, an account from a particular ship. You know, some real history, some real activity, but also some weather records that we're extracting. So this is exactly the sort of information we need to put into our databases to build our picture of past time. And if it were just one ship, that would be great. We can go out there and extract them. But we need more than one ship. We need hundreds of millions of observations. And there are millions of pages of records in the archives. But unfortunately, as you have seen from looking at those logbooks, paper is not enough. We need database records. And we heard on Tuesday about the power of robots, artificial intelligence systems for looking at images and working out where buildings were and which ones were occupied. The robots are pretty clever, but I haven't yet found one that can read logbooks. So far, that's a job that requires human input. There aren't very many of us in historical climatology, so this would take decades or centuries. So we're going to need help. And we reached out to, to try and find this help to the web itself. We reached out to a team at Oxford University, an organization called the Zooniverse, which you may have heard, and said, right, we've got all these really interesting local records. Can we find volunteers from the public, people to help us read them? And they built a website for us. So don't do it now, but next talk maybe, and you are getting bored, you know, point your web browser at oldweather.org, and you can have a play at this for yourself. Right? And also maybe digitize a few weather records for us, that would be great. Right? It's going at four times real speed because I didn't want to bore you. But essentially, what this website does is it enables you to look at a blog book, right? And there's a user interface. It's written in React.js, which probably means more to some of you than it does to me. I need to write the website. Right? It enables you to select the section that we're interested in, so dates, locations, and particularly tabular weather data, right? Tables of numbers, right? This particular uh, <coughs> is a rather good on tables of numbers. Okay. And we select the section of the logbook that contains the information that we are interested in, and then we can go on to extract it. So here we're collecting every other hour data, all sorts of weather observations for a particular day. And of course, we want not only to know where they are on the page, we hope eventually to be able to feed those sections of the page into a, 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 an artificial intelligence system, but at the moment we're all using the traditional human intelligence system, and we actually ask people to transcribe the digital. So this turns out to work fairly well. You know, certainly we've done you know, something like half a million pages of logbook through this, and many thousands of people have participated in this project and helped us um, digitize the records. Right. If you run through it, you get results looking something like this. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you logbook pages, one after the other. 
On the right hand side is the information extracted from these pages by the volunteers who are reading the logbooks and transcribing them. We ask three people to read each page. That gives us a bit of redundancy, enables us to check and understand whether the results are accurate. And I'm happy to tell you that the results are very accurate. In fact, I like to say that we're better at reading the logbooks than the original authors were at writing them. Right? Of the errors in the final results, more are due to wrong numbers being written in the logbook in the first place than the numbers in the logbook being mistranscribed by the volunteer. So, that brings us back to our data set. Right. We're obviously working very hard on making this better. You know, it's a task that's gone for a long time. There are a lot of records out there, a lot of potential opportunity to improve it. But this is our fundamental record. This then is our story of the planet. This is how we know what happened in the past. And generally, if a scientist comes up to me and says, right, I'm interested in long-term variability of a brain falling in Madagascar or something, I say, right, excellent, here are our observations. 1.9 billion observations. Nice clear format, we put it in an HDF file, here you go. Farm science is not very happy with this in general. They say, okay, but you know, they're distributed in space and time in all the wrong ways, they're a pain to use, some of them are wrong. Right? So what, one of the other things that we have to do with these observations is we have to make products from them. We have to try and turn them into a more useful product. So here's an example of, of one of the products. This is actually a visualization of the Hadoo T data set. So this actually tells us about long-term temperature variability over the Earth. So I've taken essentially that same set of observations, right? And we've made them into a gridded data set. Every five degree grid box on traditional equirectangular resolution, right? We've taken the average temperature anomaly. And what you can see in this data set is where it's hot, where it's cold, and also, of course, where we don't know whether it's hot or cold because we don't have any data. Right? This is a monthly data set, it goes back to 1850. This is in fact the basis of our long-term understanding of temperature change and temperature variability. This is definitely improvement. When I give this to climate scientists, they tend to say, okay, this is something we can use, this is useful. But they also still complain. They sit there and say, but the bit I'm interested in hasn't got any observations. There are still holes in your data set. They also complain about the large variability. In some places, it's made from not very many observations. It has uncertainties in it. we also have to interpolate it, make um, <coughs> complete data sets. This is fundamentally the same thing. This is a reconstruction of where it's hot, where it's cold, on a monthly time scale made basically from observation. But here we've added extra information. We've actually said, okay, a lot of people want complete background figures. You know, nicely smooth so they're easy to interpret, easier to use. Right? This is possibly a better representation of, uh, of, of what reality was like. This again is hot and in cold areas across the globe. This is the Haggis data set. Once again, it's made from the observations. It comes from the original human stories, but actually, uh, a great deal more smoothing and interpolation and statistical analysis has, has, been, has been put into this. Another better problem. And of course, also, we want to be able to reconstruct things other than temperature. <coughs> so increasingly, we're starting to say, okay, what can technology offer us to add to these individual observations? So back in the past, we have observations of surface weather, typically. Temperature, pressure, you know, from ships, from weather stations. But actually, what we want to know is what's going on in the whole atmosphere and the whole ocean. And we have very powerful techniques and technologies for doing that for us in our weather forecasting tools. So every, every morning, in the when we make the weather forecast, we take observations from all sources, and we feed them into a very sophisticated mathematical model of the atmosphere. And we solve that mathematical model of the atmosphere in a way that's constrained by the observations we have. That's the basis for tomorrow's weather forecast. And we can do that in 1916. It's not as good we don't have any, anything like as many weather observations, but we can do the same thing. So this fundamentally is a reconstruction of the state of the whole atmosphere, and it's probably better on the little screen, as every presenter has said so far. Um, but what you can see here, if you look really carefully, are temperature anomalies, hot and cold areas, the contour shows surface pressure, the dark green color is, uh, is, is precipitation, and you can also see uh, the, uh, uh, the wind fields. So this is a comprehensive state of the atmosphere, built up from our, our historical observations. <clears throat> and that brings us back to where I started. This is our story of how climate change has occurred over the past. This is where we get the information from. And one of the reasons I'm particularly keen to produce all these visualizations is so that we can show people, you know, we didn't make this up. This actually comes from human activities and people making individual observations. <clears throat> and I was 
I'm very happy when I, when I was asked to come and talk at this conference because the graphical web is obviously very fundamental in what we do. Not only in sharing and reproducing our results, but also, as you've seen, in reaching out to our, our, our volunteer participants in extracting historical information. Um, the old web websites are, 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 are I think, are, are an excellent example in the use of web technology in the pursuit of real science. And that's all I have for you, except one last little visualization. As I'm sure all of you know, there's a fundamental rule in science that you must always acknowledge all of your collaborators. So far, 20,000 people have participated in all weather and wrote a page for me. So I've abandoned the traditional and uh, made a credits video for them. So I'd like to finish by saying thank you to the 20,000 co-authors of this talk. Thank you. <laughs>